well, maybe I'm up. Um, I'm, uh, well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. I'm in Los Angeles, so it's still morning for me. Um, I'm Claudia Einecke, and I'm an unaffiliated curator of European art and currently a database editor at the Getty Research Institute. And I want to inter uh, in welcome you, not in yeah, and introduce you to uh, this this webinar, which um, uh, I've uh, co-organized uh, co or organized and, and will be moderating together with my cohort, Jennifer. Hello. I'm Jennifer Farrell. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I'm a curator at the Met. All right, and so together we have organized this uh, webinar on e-publishing, and um, you know that is it is one in a whole series of webinars that the AMC is putting on. That is to say, the Professional Development Committee of the AMC creates these uh, webinars four to five a year, and they cover, cover different aspects of curatorial practice. And if you haven't uh, attended to a, uh, any of the, the previous ones, they live on the website, so you can always check them out there, and I hope you do. Um, E-publishing as a, a topic today, I should say, to begin with, that is, of course, a, a huge topic, a huge field, and we're not going to cover all of it. Instead, we have focused on um, electronic versions of collections and exhibitions catalogs because we feel that that's probably what the, the, the type of thing that curators will be and are most often uh, call, called on to, to create. And so we've invited our uh, four panelists to help us discuss a little bit uh, and talk about this. And, um, well, the panel consists of, if I may put it that way. One, one of the panelists is, a, um, is not a curator, but a technology and uh, digital media specialist. Um, whereas, uh, and she will give us a little bit of uh, the bigger picture of e-publishing in general and the trend towards it in uh, museums. And the other three panelists are all curators from different institutions, and each of them has created what I think, or what we think, are really terrific examples of e-catalogs. And um, the slightly provocative title, um, you know, e-publishing, why bother, was chosen <clears throat> not because we want to talk about things like <clears throat> publications that I think we've all seen that are no more than glorified PDFs that, well, maybe are zoomable and that's it. But um, we want to talk about and introduce you to a few examples of e-publications where I think we all say, wow, here the, the going digital definitely was worth the bother. Um, so with this, oh, the, the way we will proceed is that I will hand the proceedings over to Jennifer, who will um, introduce one after another uh, the, the, the panelists. And we will not go into bios, because those you can catch on the web. We want to spend as little time as possible on those things, so that we have time to talk about uh, the aspects and concrete details that we really are interested in. So then the panelists uh, will speak and present their catalogs as appropriate. Then we will immediately switch into conversation and Q&A mode. And we will, Jennifer and I will kick it off with, with a question of our own. But then um, we hope that, that very quickly all of you will jump in uh, with your own questions and comments and drive the conversation that way. So I guess then you're up next. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Claudia. It's a great introduction, and again, all of our uh, panelists have incredible resumes and bodies of work, and we encourage you to check out the website with a more complete biography as well as their work, uh, some of which she'll be discussing with us today. So to kick off the discussion, I am going to introduce Amy uh, Haibo, who is the Vice President and Head of Technology at LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art where she oversees technology and web and di digital media strategy. And um, she's also worked with the Getty Scholarly Catalog um, Initiative. So um, 
Amy, if you could tell us a little bit about what is meant by an e-publication or e-publishing. I think these are kind of new terms for many of us. I'm including myself in the mix. Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for joining us, and thank you, Claudia and Jennifer, for including me. It's, uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Um, so for somebody like me who comes at it from a web development um, point of view, EPUB, um, which we generally use now as an abbreviation for any um, book type product online, means something very specific. EPUB is a specific digital format that emerged around 2007 and has evolved since then. And the goal of the EPUB format was to come up with a way to publish um, across platforms. So um, we've um, struggled a lot um, to keep up with the rise of iPads and smartphones and changes in web browsers. And EPUB was an attempt to um, kind of come up with a vanilla format that would work across devices. Um, you don't have to worry too much about what EPUB means specifically to someone like me. The thing to know is that when we're talking about a digital publication, there's an entire spectrum of products, and it helps to be um, conversant in sort of what the range of that spectrum and um, be able to understand the relative complexity of different options um, in, in in, that occur along that range. So there are, um, there are, and and you might also want to know about iBooks. So iBooks is a proprietary format that's designed for iOS devices, which means um, iPhones, iPads, um, and it uses EPUB as its platform. So if somebody says to you, do you want to do an EPUB or do you want to do an iBook, and there's someone like me, that's what they're asking you. But um, what what you want to talk about is a digital publication. And that can be truly as simple as a PDF scan of a book. At my institution, one of the very first ventures that we made in um, online publications was just scanning our out-of-print catalogs and releasing those online for free. Um, and that was tremendously successful and actually led, um, to give one example, to an entire revival of interest in an historic um, project we had run in the late 1960s called Art and Technology. It had basically been forgotten and um, not included in much of the art historical writing about that period. And by putting that publication online, um, it, we now see it cited um, in dissertations. It's circulating again in art history programs. So that, that option, which can be very inexpensive, is I think not to be overlooked. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, there are these kind of very ro robust, um, designed, um, as born digital kind of um, standalone websites, which uh, is how we approach the online scholarly catalog. And those um, include book length manuscripts and a full range of interactive features that really take advantage of the online environment to create an experience for the reader that's very different than, um, than um, reading a physical book in a lot of ways. So I think we'll see great examples today of, um, of those types of features and where they've really made an impact on the reading experience. Uh, to give you a little bit of background in terms of the strategic thinking behind the shift to e-publications, I mean, of course, we're all following an evolution that's happening in the world that's being driven by by um, the rapid evolution of technology. But in museums, as we started to think about online publications, I think we've seen a host of um, accurate perceptions about the opportunities that are inherent in that, and also some misperceptions um, based on lack of familiarity with the technology. So let me explain what I mean. In terms of um, opportunity. I think absolutely there's the potential for broader reach with an online publication. We all know that um, to the extent that these publications are searchable and findable and you can do things to make them readily findable, they have the potential to reach a much, much broader audience. Um, that said, that does require some effort. <laughs> you have to put it out there in a way that makes it easy to find and get the links in the right places for your target audience. Um, the, rich, the richness and interactivity of the content, and we'll see great examples today, is really key. And I think um, curators are, are 
the drivers of the thinking about how to leverage those tools online because people like me know how to build them. We know how to make them happen for you, but we need to understand the stories that you want to tell in order to make a recommendation for the right kind of tools. So if you can explain a conservation process or um, an opportunity to look at some um, X-ray photography that reveals the underdrawing of a painting or just help us understand what it is that we can show rather than just describe in the manuscript. That can help us help you take advantage of um, an increasingly um, um, sophisticated range of online reading tools. In terms of misperceptions, there's a, a, a few things I just want to call out and then we'll have a chance to discuss these more later today. But I think the number one misperception is that the cost of production is lower. What is true is that the cost um, is dispersed across several different cost centers that some of which may be unfamiliar, um, including web hosting, server maintenance, um, maintaining that publication as browsers evolve because we don't have control over the toolkit the reader is using to access the online publication. The providers of web browsers have control over that environment and we have to evolve the publication to meet those ever-changing standards. Um, there are design, technical design considerations and there are um, engineering costs to building the content management system that you and the editors might work in in order to produce the publication. Um, those are all very different and we are that the world of technology is changing so fast that those costs move around a lot. So book publishing has been much the same for a very long time and it's very easy I think for um, for us to forecast what a publication is going to cost based on various factors. It can be more difficult to forecast the final cost of an online publication. And, um, and that cost needs to include maintenance. And the other thing I would say is that there is a larger team on an online publication. So I think that you know that. I think all of our panelists today can speak to that. But I think we've all had the experience, um, some of us learning the hard way, that you still need the manuscript editor. You still need the copy editor. You also need an HTML editor. You also need a, a web designer, um, sort of web content manager who can think about how does this text relate to this interactive feature? What's the best place and means of presenting this video um, in relation to some of the other material included in this publication? And you need very strong leadership to coordinate all the pieces of that team. Um, but I think that can also be tremendously fun. People like me who work with technology, who work inside a museum, do that because they love working with people like you, because they're drawn to the content, they want to hear those stories. And I think it's a great opportunity for collaboration across um, silos in the museum that haven't always had a, um, a chance or a habit to work um, deeply together. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the panelists and um, I look forward to looking at some fine examples of online publishing. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Amy. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions for you um, in the discussion section, which is going to be at the end of the webinar. But uh, people can start submitting questions now if you, if you like. Um, so the next presenter will be Darcy Kiernan who is a curator of musical instruments at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. He developed a, an e-publication, Musical Instruments, which was released as an e-publication and also in a more traditional format. So, Darcy, please tell us about your, your experience. Uh, will do. Um, do I do this? I'm trying to handle the technology here a little bit. Um, <laughs> And in interest of full disclosure, um, sitting next to me off screen is um, Anna Barnett, who works in our publications department and worked closely with me on this book, but uh, today is also making sure I don't mess up the uh, computer aspect of this. Um, so I have on screen for you, this is the title page of, of the, both the, the print version and the, and the e-publication, and I'm going to try to be coordinated enough to kind of just go through some of the pages as I'm talking and um, hope that uh, Jennifer and Claudia will keep me on track in terms of the time here. So I'm going to just scroll past some of the intro there and get to some nicer images. Um, so this project began as a, a print version that was published in uh, 2004. 
This is from a series of MFA highlights books that uh, at present includes about 15 volumes from all sorts of subjects across the museum, uh, paintings, jewelry, photographs, uh, Japanese art, Chinese art, all, quite, a, quite a broad encyclopedic range. Um, all of them take more or less the same format of about 100 objects from a given uh, collection uh, with very good photographs and, and very what I would call accessible text. These are often written by uh, multiple curators. In this case, um, I authored all of the entries um, for this publication. When we did the print version, we, we certainly considered including a, a CD with recordings, but just really couldn't manage the logistics of that um, at that time. So I was very pleased when in about 2011 uh, the Publications Department approached me about making this into an ebook. They wanted to get their feet wet in e-publications and said that they assumed this would be a good one to start with because they would guess we already had many of the instruments recorded, uh, which was quite too true. We, we had about 60 out of the 100 um, instruments already uh, with audio files available and we talked about exploring doing some videos uh, for this publication as well. Um, from a financial standpoint, we were fortunate we had very uh, uh, um, uh, generous donors in my department, in the Department of Musical Instruments, to support this project, so we didn't really have to worry about that um, too much. Um, we, at the time, we didn't really see going with this as an online uh, publication. It really wasn't an option, so it was a question of turning this print book into an e-book. We worked with a company that specialized in e-books called MetroDigi, and we wanted and sort of needed to preserve the print layout on, of this book. So the, the workable option was an enhanced fixed layout EPUB, which I've tried to learn to memorize that expression, but I still don't have it quite down. Um, we definitely had to work with limits of, of the file size. Uh, as a curator, I would have loved to have an audio or video sample for every one of the 100 or so instruments, but that would have really made an uh, unwieldy um, file size. Now, this was originally set up uh, only for uh, use on an iPad, but then uh, segued into the ability to use iPhones, and now it's available um, on many other uh, Apple desktop products as well, and is available through um, iTunes. Uh, now, to create these audios and videos, I myself ended up taking on the role of sort of the producer and art director, um, sometimes even the announcer of uh, you know which audio was going to be played, um, and even as a performer, which was fun for me. I had to even hold back to to not overdo how many times I was going to be on screen with this. Um, Let's see, I'm just trying to follow my notes. Um, we ended up with uh, um, 23 videos in the end and 25 um, audios. I made more audios than we actually were able to fit in, but that was the, what we ended up with. The, the audios were pretty straightforward um, in terms of, uh, we had done these before for an audio guide system for the instrument gallery, but there was still a lot of choices that had to be made. We had to find musicians that were appropriate uh, for this. Um, we had to make sure the instruments were in playable condition, at least for a, a short um, uh, audio clip. Um, we didn't always use MFA instruments, and if we had to use a surrogate, we were very clear that this was not the actual thing that you're looking at in the book. We had to schedule all these recording sessions and make sure that we had appropriate music that was ideally not more than about three minutes in length, uh, make sure there's no copyright issues, and then uh, get a signed release from each of the um, musicians. The videos had you know, many of those same issues, uh, but there was further complexity. We had to find an appropriate location for shooting them, which we were lucky. We have a beautiful museum with lots of ready-made backdrops, sometimes historically correct to the instrument, sometimes more generic. Um, sometimes the performers came in what were very interesting and appropriate costumes. We might have thought about redoing that um, uh, going forward, but, but it added a nice look in many cases. Um, and then we, of course, had to do all this video shooting before or after the museum was open to the public for, for the control of noise and, and traffic. Um, there was, you know, some uh, layout logistics, uh, the choice of, you know, we went round and round a bit on just what sort of icons we were going to use for the videos and the audios, and then where was their placement on the page, and did they send the right message. 
in converting this uh, this ebook, uh, converting it from a print book to an ebook, we were allowed to do a limited amount of editing and, and updates, but nothing that would really throw off the uh, the, the page layout itself. Um, we would probably approach this project differently now if we were uh, rather than an ebook. We might do it as something that we would put uh, on the web, um, and in fact, we would love to see this sort of product available through our website at some point. So it's it's really at this stage it's it's a snapshot in time of what we were able to do back back when we did it. When we uh, when we launched this, we offered a free download of, download of the ebook for the first month. Uh, and this proved to be very popular. We got 2,765 downloads uh, in that free period, and that's versus uh, just a few more, 2,969 that have been purchased um, since um, since that time. Um, let's see. At the same time, we also did launch uh, an ebook about Arts of Korea um, that did have some some minor ways to do. Uh, uh, interaction with the, the images on screen. Um, we did a free download of that as well, and that was done in tandem with the print version of that. Um, as far as going forward with other MFA you know, ebooks, we're still thinking about that. I can't speak for our publications department, but there'd be opportunities to work with, you know, uh, with contemporary art, with performance artists or video artists, uh, but this one seemed like a logical way uh, to get our feet wet uh, because of the, the obvious uh, performance aspect in, inherent in the um, uh, the music. Um, so now I just want to show you quickly uh, a, a, an example of an audio clip, or you can hear it. Um, and I'll apologize because of the way that this is done over the internet that they might sound a little bit fuzzy or, or, or the video might be a little bit bumpy. But here is a, a, a lap steel guitar that in our collection from about 1949. This happens to be one of my, one of my favorite objects, certainly, but also one of my favorite audios. Let me see if I can get it to... Uh, Provising a lively tune in Western swing style on the museum's ultratoned lap steel guitar. <laughs> And in the interest of time, I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave it at that, and I'm gonna scroll back a couple pages. Um, here will be an example of one of my favorite videos. This is on a Chinese lute called a pipa in our collection. And let's see if we can get that to open up. There we go. And again, apologies if this is not completely clear. If you buy the book through iTunes, you'll see how wonderful it is. <coughs> and this was shot in um, a gallery of Chinese furniture at the museum. So again, we were blessed with really great, great backdrops um, for this. So again, I'm going to cut that uh, cut that short and uh, make sure there's time for the other panelists to speak. So that's the that's the general nature of what we did here. We have to turn that off. Hold on. Maybe we should keep it for the rest of the program. Yeah. <laughs> Our music. Uh, well, wonderful. Thank you, Darcy. Sure. So now we're going to move to Liz Glass. Liz Glass is the Digital Scholarship Editor at Brown University, and she had worked at the Getty Online Scholarly Catalog Initiative, a fellow at the uh, Walker Art Center, where she worked on the series The Living Collections Catalog. So Liz, I wonder if you might be able to tell us a little bit about your experience developing um, that catalog for the Walker. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much um, for having me. Um, let me turn on my, show my screen. Um, no, I can't see anything on my screen, of course. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so I'll just, I'll start with a few slides and then I'll, I'll transition um, to looking at the site itself. Um, so the Walker's Catalog is actually a series uh, called the Living Collections Catalog. It's aimed to be in, you know, a repeatable narrative 
um, series that will continue on past uh, the funding from the Getty Foundation. Uh, the Walker was part of this online scholarly catalog initiative that Amy spoke about that was funded from beginning in 2009 until 2019, which included the Walker um, and other museums, including the Tate, LACMA, the uh, Art Institute of Chicago, and others. That was really aimed to kind of, I guess, experiment with various ways that museums could use the online publication format to um, make their collections research more accessible. Um, so each museum under this initiative was free to experiment with their own forms and build types of publications that made sense for them. So um, with the Walker, you know, they we ended up with something that kind of uh, occupied a space between the traditional kind of collection catalog, which the Walker, you know, had been producing about one every ten years, um, this giant tome that would become outdated fairly quickly. Um, so the, you know, the online catalog kind of is a is an answer to this sort of publication and also sort of takes the form of an online magazine a bit, um, kind of mirroring other things that the Walker has already been doing with their website for for several years. Um, the Walker, of course, has a very dynamic website that kind of replicates, um, you know, being an, an arts news center as well as a kind of mirror to what the museum is doing. Um, so there are two volumes so far of the Living Collections catalog. The first on performativity was launched in June of 2014, although it was begun a few years before that. And the second, Art Expanded, 1958 to 1978, came out in the spring of 2015. Um, this is just a screenshot of our Colophon page from the second volume. but And this just gives kind of a snapshot. Um, Amy already spoke about this, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again later on. You know, the team for building publications like this is large. Um, this is, you know, not an inclusive list of everyone who worked on the project, but at the, at the Walker, the, this initiative was spearheaded by Robin Dowden, who was the director of new media at the Walker at the time. Um, and within Robin's department, there were several designers. There, there was a designer, a front end, and a back end developer who helped build the, um, the custom CMS that uh, we used to lay out the site. Um, on the curatorial side, the you know the content of the catalogs fell to the collections curators and um, the fellows working on this publication, including myself. Um, the The first volume was under the direct direction of Betsy Carpenter, who was formerly the Walkers. Curator of Collections, and then um, the Associate Curator, Eric Crosby. Um, so that's a bit just about the team. Um, and this this is a quick, um, well, I, I'll follow my notes, it'll go better. Um, so the idea behind the Walker's Living Collections catalog was not only to um, make pre-existing collections research accessible, but to catalyze reasons to do new collections research, working in a space like the Walker, um, and I'm sure many, many other institutions, prioritizing collections research when there are so many other things going on is difficult. So I think this was really an opportunity for the museum to prioritize that. Um, and so the first volume and the original kind of concept of the catalogs was a thematic look into the collection, and it it didn't um, follow along other museum programming. It was it was a, a separate project. Um, for the second catalog, we did align it with a collections exhibition, um, so that the workflows would complement one another in a more um, productive way. Um, so this is uh, just a screenshot of our CMS system that our, our developers built. Um, it's based on a three-column um, system. You can, you know, there can be text and images taking up all three columns, so you can have three separate 
items in, in each column at any given point in the screen, or you can have a, a full-size image or a full-size column of text. Um, so, you know, uh, we talked about this a bit as well already, as too, but um, one of the things about having an online publication that, you know, it lives in a web browser, it's based on a web browser, it is also designed to be um, adaptable and scalable to various kinds of devices, so it appears differently, but still maintains its good design on various kinds of devices. Um, so I'll switch off now and just go to the site and talk a little bit about some of the features. Um, so all of the try to get rid of that. Um, both of the catalogs are divided into essays in the way that a traditional edited volume may be. Um, each has its own table of contents um, that serves as a guide to the various components. Um, the first volume was uh, designed on a model of having uh, three very long essays at the beginning that were kind of thematic um, considerations of the idea of art, contemporary art and performance. Um, in the second volume we moved more towards um, object-based, um, um, object-anchored essays, so they're a bit shorter and each of them address a particular object or yeah. event or um, something else from the museum's history and collection. Um, and we also introduced in the second volume a, a new type of content, which we called archive capsules, which I'll get to a bit later. Um, so, you know, of the many benefits of working online, we have, you know, the ability to include really rich numbers and quality of images. Um, you know, all of our essays have more images than we would be able to include in a printed volume. Um, you know, in some cases there are slideshows, in some cases, um, in, in all cases you can, you know, zoom in to pretty high quality images, which is fantastic for people looking at visual materials. Um, each of the essays has, you know, kind of these nice little web-based things like abstracts and citations that pop out, as well as footnotes. Um, there, the volumes all have this top bar navigation that allows you to skip from one essay to the next, and then there's also a sidebar um, section navigation um, so that you can move down um, through an essay more quickly. Um, you know, like like the MFA's catalog, one of the other great things for us in dealing with largely art of the mid-century for this particular um, volume, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of performance-based art or media, you know, sound and video and all of these things, and it's really great, it was really great for us to be able to, you know, instead of having text that describes a work, you know, you can actually have sections of that work, um, which is a, an essay about the work of Jack Smith, and um, so we were able to, with the kindness of the Gladstone Gallery, include as many clips as we wanted of Jack Smith's normal love in the volume. Um, so the, the other thing that we developed for this particular iteration of the catalog is um, are these nodes that we're, we call archive capsules, but what they do um, really is allow us to share a, like a vast amount of material about things that we kind of categorize as more uncollectible moments, um, things that might not be object-based that are more difficult to represent perhaps in a traditional um, scholarly mode. Um, so we have three in volume two. This one um, is considering uh, a happening that Alan Caprell performed for the Walker in Minneapolis in 1962, which was a fairly early point in his career of making happenings. Um, and, you know, the Walker has an amazing archive of materials surrounding this performance. Um, and so we devised kind of, you know, our, our discussions with the designers were basically involved me bringing all of this stuff to a conference 
room and putting it on a table and saying like we want to put all of this online we want it to be like the experience of looking at this table and discovering for yourself what this event was about um, so we have this kind of three sectioned sort of thing uh, capsule here we are able to this is a sound. lecture on how to make it happen um, this is a, a there are 11 LP that Alan Capra made that's him in voiceover describing what a happening is and how to do one um, there are uh, objects here from the Walker's collection um, you know a lot of happenings are documented through ephemera such as posters and other paper um, then we also have you know a section that's about the happening in particular we have great archival materials like Capra's handwritten score that exists in our own archives at the Walker um, there's photographs that I was able to recover from a local historical society the Walker actually didn't have any photographs of this event itself but the newspaper negatives collection at the Historical Society did, so um, this is the first time that any of these images have been available since 1962, which is fantastic for us. Um, and then we we're also, you know, able to include correspondence, um, you know, in this particular case, the, the response from the public was a very interesting component of this performance, and, you know, we thought it was great to include Here's a snippets of that um, in another one of these, which I'll show you briefly. Um, another one of these archive capsules is based on an exhibition that was held at the Walker in 1967 that was about kinetic um, light art. And so, and kind of in a forgotten moment of collection history, the Walker actually purchased a number of the works out of this unusual sort of um, exhibition and so another thing that this this catalog kind of catalyzed was new documentation and restoration of many of these objects that the museum hasn't necessarily even shown since the 1960s um, so those are you know some of the things that we were really excited about incorporating into this project and um, this is just a video of this very strange but very cool kind of psychedelic projector, um, this liquid light projector that uh, is in the Walker's collection that we unearthed in the last couple of years for the first time since the 60s. Um, so that is kind of a, a brief walkthrough and I'm happy to, you know, speak at the end, answer any questions. Um, I guess in my last my last note is to uh, our last prompt, question prompt was, you know, what are the challenges that you faced in doing these kinds of projects? And I think I would point um, to Oski's, uh, the Getty's great interim report on the online scholarly catalog initiative project. Um, it, it really addresses a lot of things that not only the Walker, but also the other institutions faced um, in planning and executing these projects. Off. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, so for our last presenter is going to be Namita Gupta Wiggers. She's an independent curator and writer, and um, she had been the Director of the Critical, she's the director of the Critical Craft Forum in Portland, Oregon. Um, she was the director and chief curator of the Museum of Contemporary Craft, where she developed the extremely innovative and um, long overdue exhibition um, that's focusing object focus the bowl in 2013 that received you know rave reviews in the New York Times as well as um, the tumbler that she developed to accompany the exhibition so Namita I was wondering if you could uh, walk us through a little bit your project absolutely thank you very much for including me in this I'm thrilled to share this and I'm hoping that our conversation will help um, get at some of the, the challenges of the smaller museums too because our museum is, is a great example of that. 
So I'm going to just share my screen here. And I'm going to try to do this a little bit like a pachakacha. So um, I'm going to speak a little bit more quickly and uh, run through the logistics and how this, um, how this project came together and then some of the challenges with it. So I have to say off the bat that I love books. Um, I have a problem with collecting books. I have too many. I'm sure all of us sort of feel the same way. But the challenge with producing books when you work at a small museum is the fact that the small museums don't have the budget to produce the kind of publications that we would really like to do. Um, this is just to give you some information at Museum of Contemporary Craft, which was operating in partnership with Pacific Northwest College of Art at the time. We had an annual budget of $110,000 to cover five exhibitions per year, and you can see how staff changes um, affected that on the curatorial and education side. Um, but basically, you know, our, our small budget had to cover pretty much everything uh, that didn't include the actual staff salaries for the, the curators and some of the other overhead expenses. <coughs> so with this project, which took place in 2013, uh, we really wanted to think about a way to um, create a platform using a very limited budget but create a platform for communicating the curatorial concept behind the exhibition. And part of what we did was use a heuristic that was developed by Rick Robinson. Um, it's an AEIOU model, which looks at user behavior in terms of activities, um, environments, interactions, objects, and users. And what you see here is our really rough sketching of, of the environments that bowls would be circulated in for this exhibition. And we realized that in some ways maybe it was a blessing that we didn't have a budget for a publication because it was really clear that the linearity of a book and the immediacy of responding to people using the bulls for this project might not have been well served in a book format at all. And we started looking at Tumblr as we were developing the idea for an alternative as a way of um, creating a catalog and documentation of the project at the same time. So the project itself ran from March to September of 2013, and it had two main components uh, under which a lot of the different aspects of the project um, were, were contained, sort of umbrellas. The umbrellas, if you will, were reflect and respond and engage and use. Reflect and respond, as you can see, was a much more traditional museum format bowls and pedestals and vitrines, and you can see the computer in the back there, which allowed for the tumbler to be present within the space as a means of, of providing an on-site access for visitors. Engage and Use really focused on um, circulatory systems like libraries. Uh, we circulated bowls through artist-driven projects through the museum at, where people could borrow them, take them home, document them, and then share their experiences, and this could also happen through Bowls circulated by another artist project through the Multnomah County Library. There were also um, videos, bowls that had um, videos by uh, about chefs talking about bowls as tool, etc. So a lot of different components that went into the engaging news aspect downstairs. So the thing for us was trying to figure out, knowing a that we didn't have the budget to produce a publication, and b nor did we have the budget to hire a web designer to create a, a specific project, the question was, could we use social media platforms to generate curatorial content and to, to show research? But then you know, it, it had to combine with marketing, but we also had to figure out how we could use these platforms in a way that was really about curating and the curatorial premises as being central for the project. The second thing we really, in, in retrospect, had to think about was, what does free really mean? because each of these platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Flickr, and Tumblr, technically they are free, but many of them require membership and they require you to follow specific templates, and there's also questions about whether the content is actually yours or not um, in many ways, and uh, those are some of the issues that I think circulate when you use these kinds of platforms for curatorial projects in this way of, of um, catalogs in, in this sense. So specifically, to give you an idea of exactly how tight the budget was, we had $6,000 in restricted funds for this project. 
Um, and we uh, allocated that to writers and to artists. Um, this was a very, very nominal artist honorarium. At least they got 30 cents a word, if not more. Um, and the artists were invited to, se several artists were invited to come out and um, participate in other kinds of projects. But the remainder of the bulk of the expenses came through general operating funds. And just to give a sense, I don't know how many of you are as familiar with Tumblr, but Tumblr is, is different from Facebook and Twitter in that you don't have to be a member to participate. Anybody can get onto a Tumblr site and look at it. On top of that, um, you do have to sign on to the app, I believe, but, but you don't have to be a member in the same way. Um, and it allows for lots of different kind of content. So it gave us the chance to expand beyond the written word, beyond just the printed image, but to actually incorporate video and the other kinds of things that you saw on some of the other web projects that have been talked about so far. It's also a flexible and easy site. People understand today how to use it, so it gives a chance for it to um, operate in within already within that social media context that people are familiar with, with sharing and tweeting and so forth. Uh, the main thing that is important, and I think people have touched on this already, is the fact that you really have to work with other departments and with the team. And um, when you work in a small museum, you don't have a lot of resources. And as part of a college or a university, you are truly competing with everybody else's um, priorities as well. So we were really fortunate that the story was picked up by Julie Lasky in the New York Times, and that opened up the content um, for user-driven content to be really international in scope as the project progressed. So I want to give you just a very, very brief tour of the web of the uh, uh, Tumblr site just to give you a sense of how it works. So you can choose the templates um, with Tumblr. The linearity that I was mentioning before, though, I mean, I have to be honest that Tumblr is linear, too. You're scrolling down which means that whatever your last content that you added on there is the first content that your viewer or your visitor is going to see. We wanted to make sure to include a number of different things here and we thought a long time about what these categories needed to be in order to address the project. So we had the call for participation, a formal checklist, and I think the archive is the one that I want to share with you really briefly. Um, you can see that in the last month we loaded it up with a lot of videos. These were the videos from the project. Um, some of them were generated by the museum. Some of them were generated by artists or created by artists. And then we had a mixture in here of some of these kinds of projects, which were uh, content that was given to us by visitors who borrowed bowls from the museum. But down at the very, very beginning in May, or excuse me, in March, is where we have content that was generated by scholars and curators and writers in the field uh, based on responses to images of bowls that we provided to them. Uh, so it was really very much almost a call and response kind of thing. But you can see that this content here tends to be things that the museum at the beginning that the museum generated and as the project developed it really moved into more of um, content that users were generating in addition to what the museum was producing. So to get everyone started, we gave them pictures of selected bowls that we knew would be on view, and we invited them to write no more than 500 words about a bowl, meaning one of these bowls, my bowl, meaning one of their own bowls, or the bowl to address the concept of the bowl itself. And you can see here that on, on view in the museum and then on site, or on the web, on, on the uh, internet with the Tumblr blog, you could see the essays and kind of close up that loop there. One of the things that was really great was the flexibility that Tumblr allowed. So it allowed us to then incorporate visitor-generated drawings that happened. Um, in fact, we've had so many stu uh, students and visitors start to draw the bulls that we began a drawing wall in the exhibition itself, and it gave us the chance to kind of bring that into the Tumblr blog very easily. It allowed us to incorporate content we generated as well as these unexpected things, like one of our visitors, our, our uh, gallery attendants noticed that visitors were trying to get closer to the bulls, and so there were nose prints and forehead prints and fingerprints on the vitrines when she would clean them in the morning, and she started tracking that, so we got a sense of which bulls were really encouraging people to want to get closer. Um, so these kinds of unexpected things were able to be incorporated into the Tumblr site. It also allowed for us to share the platform. 
So not only was the museum producing content that was scholarly and um, scholarship it, it being an important part of it, but it also opened up the space for um, incorporating visitor stories and self-documentation, and um, particularly at a moment when self-documentation is know pretty much what everybody is doing on the internet these days. In terms of logistics, um, in writing and editing took up a, a colossal amount of time and I think it's really important to understand that because we didn't have an editor on staff, the staff, the curatorial staff, had to serve as the writers and editors um, and really copy editors at the same time. Um, with the commissions and the volunteered submissions, we really had to monitor to make sure the images were good quality, um, the, the content didn't have typos and, and the grammar was correct, so that was a constant ongoing process um, within the curatorial team to make that happen. Um, but And as I said, we, we were able to then also be responsive because I dedicated a staff person to monitoring the Tumblr site on a daily basis. In terms of logistics, making this content public is easy, but it is time consuming. And it does require you to come up with a system that makes it easy to get the content from visitors and from the commissioned writers and be able to then quickly put it up in this blog format. It also required daily maintenance because the way that Tumblrs work and the way these social media platforms work is that you have to generate the content on an ongoing basis. If, you're, if you sort of stall, then um, you start to lose interest from people who are visiting the site on a regular basis. And this also leads to a challenge um, for the site itself, where now basically that Tumblr blog is sort of a static archive, and it's no longer a daily changing kind of a thing. Um, in terms of calendar and content management, the other tricky thing is making sure that you space out your content. And I think one of the mistakes that we made was that we we front-loaded a lot of the um, scholarly essays right at the very beginning, so when you go to the archive, they all sit kind of in a cluster rather than being interspersed, which was conceptually what the idea was um, in, in terms of sharing a platform. So that content management had, has to be thought through um, for the duration of the project. What did we learn? We really learned that social media can offer an opportunity to rethink curatorial publishing. And in this particular case, the Tumblr blog really functioned in the way that we wanted it to be a tether. So it became sort of this on-site link to all these things that were happening all over the city, and, in, and by extension also across the country and, and in um, other countries outside of the US as well. And it gave us a chance to really rethink uh, the format in the, of an and to produce sort of an alternative catalog that didn't follow the linear path that a book does. It didn't have the, um, the sort of the two-page format and the whole sort of progression through a series of pages. It gave us a chance to sort of experiment with some flexibility there. So to disrupt linearity, but also it was really important that this was generated from the, the curatorial perspective so it allowed us to, pre to preserve curatorial integrity while still opening up a platform to share voice. And I think the risk for the kind of project we did is really the future of the site and longevity. In a, Tumblr is a private company. Things could change at any minute. Um, passwords get, get stolen and corrupted at any moment. And um, right now, the Museum of Contemporary Craft no longer exists. It was incorporated into Pacific Northwest College of Art in a partnership in 2009. And in February of this year, the, the uh, college announced that they were closing the museum and pulling the collection and the archive into a center for art and culture, which means that the, um, there's always the possibility that uh, the, the content may or may not survive long term. So that is presentation and I'm going to find the menu so I can unshare my screen. Great. All right. Um, well, let me take over then. Um, thank you very much all of you. That that was that was really fantastic. And of course um, it, it was our intention, and I think it succeeded very well to show very different 
types of online catalogs or uh, electronic catalogs. Um, I'm going to deviate. Well, actually, I had a different question in mind, but um, I would like to start with, with a different one, um, just coming out of what uh, the note uh, on, on which Namida um, ended, and that is to address the longevity. Um, of online or, or electronic publications. I mean, we all know, you know, if we print a book, if we print a catalog, um, even if the print run is only 500 and they get dis dispersed and distributed around the world, well, 50 years from now, some library somewhere will still have um, a copy and we can access it. Um, with something that is online or elect electro electronically available, um, if the institution, for one reason or another, takes down the website or whatever it might be, um, the, the, the content is lost, isn't it? So what, what does your, what, what, what do you know, maybe it's more, more a question to Amy, but what is done, what, what is the thinking these days of uh, what, what kind of commitment does an institution have to make for, for, uh, to, to a, an electronic publication? And then are there all, a lot more aspects to the whole thing as well, but uh, we'll get to that. We already have some questions coming in from the audience too. Maybe I, may, Claudia, maybe I can just jump in very briefly. When Namita was talking, I wrote down a note to myself, and it just says DAMS in all caps. <laughs> and DAMS is an abbreviation for Digital Asset Management System, and I know that many of you have them. Um, it's sometimes, Digital Asset Management Systems are sometimes regarded as just a sort of repository for photography assets. Um, and I think that all of our institutions could benefit from um, advocacy, <laughs> this is my plug for curators to help, um, <laughs> help promote the importance of having a good digital asset management system because the whole point of a digital asset management system is that all of the things that you develop for an intended platform, so in this case for, for Tumblr, get put into this archive. It's like the collections management system and it's, it's typically a supplement to that system. But if all of that content is stored in a database um, that's managed with the intention of preserving the content, then it can be reused across other platforms. But it's, it's very easy and um, and one of the first places that people typically cut corners um, is to, to overlook the need for the dam, to just focus on the deadline and getting the project launched. And then somebody somewhere, or maybe a whole bunch of somebody's, has digital files all over their personal network storage and, you know, wherever else it is. Um, the, you know, the web is going to evolve and platforms are going to change. Um, just within my tenure at LACMO, we used to produce all our mobile content in a flash format that um, is not supported by um, iOS devices. And so almost immediately and without a whole lot of warning, um, the world changed and you couldn't use that flash content anymore. But if in the course of production you stored the highest resolution asset that you have available, then it's going to be easy to parse that content out to other platforms. Um, DAMS projects are not sexy. They're hard to fund. Um, they're, they happen sort of behind the scenes. But I think if you ask at the outset of any significant online project, what is our strategy for digital asset preservation for everything, video, images, audio files, text assets, then you're really in a very safe position to move forward without losing anything. Jennifer? Great. Um, maybe I'll ask the first question that we received. And um, it says, getting these e-publications online and out there is a great thing. Uh, what kind of strategies can be employed to reach student and research audiences through university or college libraries? And that's to the panel. Um, uh, so I'll speak for the Walker. One of the things that we did was work with our own librarian at the Walker to try to um, send it out to the um, Association of Art, Muse Art and Museum Librarians. Um, but to try to get different libraries to catalog this in their own um, digital catalog so that if someone at a university or a museum was searching, um, they would they would find this entry and could link to it. Um, you know, the, the catalogs have 
uh, DOIs, which is Digital Object Indicator, which uh, you know serves as something like a call number. Um, they also have ISBN numbers, but it is difficult because they don't circulate in the same channels um, that print publications do. But um, doing outreach and you know having the the museum community and and the academic community as well, uh, since I'm working with digital publications in an academic setting now, um, figuring out how to make those um, those pathways of dissemination more clear would be great. Um, so far for us at the Walker, it was, you know, kind of a, a DIY sort of effort. Um, we also had the advantage of doing an evaluation at the end of the first two volumes. So we were able to get it out to people via and other um, other channels like that because we we're asking for feedback from various segments of our audience. I think there's also a way to um, to think about how students are getting their information too, and it does seem like you know our our libraries are absolutely. The essential place to get make sure they get valid information, but I think it's important also to understand how um, our students are accessing any information, and this is where social media and other kinds of things come into play. And if um, I think it's important to figure out how to connect with folks through those other social media channels as well. Um, to get the, 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 the data to them and to get them connected into the projects. With the musical instruments ebook from the MFA, we we definitely saw this as a, a, a really uh, potentially good uh, teaching tool for educators, uh, music educators, anywhere from grade school up through college. Uh, we made a concerted effort to let them know when it came out, um, certainly to the local colleges and music departments, but also to the, I think it was the Music Educators National Association to get the word out. I don't know how many of them picked up on it. It's probably time to sort of let them know about it again. Um, I was very pleased that we were able to keep the, the cost through iTunes down to nine ninety nine, so it's pretty accessible to anyone that uh, would want to use it um, and you know have it available to but I think it'd be a great it's a great teaching tool for kids again going forward I think we're probably going to try to put this content on our website somehow so that it's just readily accessible and the, we never we never envisioned making a lot of money off of this this ebook it was more of a test of the technology and and, and how to go about this um, but I, I still really enjoy pointing it out to people that it exists and they're often pleasantly surprised so we should, we should probably publicize it again here before too long. Well, um, okay, great. Um, let's go on. To the, we have we have plenty of questions, so um, I guess it's going in the same direction. What is the best way to estimate cost for an EPUB and staff time needed for an EPUB, especially if you are at a small museum without a dedicated publishing department and IT department? So that's a tough situation to be in. I think it's really doable, though. There are a lot of free tools. I think Namita's example of using Tumblr is a great one. It's just, it's really, um, that's, that's a very innovative way to use Tumblr. And there are a lot of free um, solutions. If you're flexible in how you define an online publication, um, but my advice would be to templatize, so not to wait until you have a specific project and a pile of content and then try to figure out how to get it online, but to begin by defining what, what, what's your goal, what do you want to do, knowing what, what you know and having talked to some other people in the field, what are the costs, um, estimate the number of hours. I think, the, um, I think Liz mentioned the the um, Getty's interim reports. They also have a fantastic follow-up um, evaluation of the OSCE projects. They include a lot of detail, including all of our estimates for the number of hours that various tasks took and what we underestimated and what we um, forgot to estimate altogether. And then I would put together kind of a template and say, okay, this is what we think we can afford to do. You know, you can do something for $5,000, $10,000, or $200,000 and and figure out what you're able to do. And then 
and then evaluate the content from that point of view. But I think, unfortunately, too often we start with the, um, in technology there's a word called the skeuomorph. It means we have a concept of a non-digital thing and we create the digital world to mimic that thing. So we start with the idea of a book length manuscript and the process behind a book and we mimic that online. And that can back you into a production process that's very um, expensive if you're not careful, but if you start with a definition of a digital product that you feel comfortable and good about, and then you work, um, you know, and then you work toward finding the the right stories to tell that take advantage of that format, I think you get to the result that you want with a lot less drama and suffering. <laughs> just may I just uh, interject? So obviously, well, not everybody may have heard of the Getty. It's an uh, OSCE program or, or uh, initiative, online scholarly catalog initiative. And so you will be able to find information about that and as well the, the uh, report that, that has been mentioned on the Getty website, right? That's right. And it was through the Getty Foundation, so not okay. the, the museum. Yeah. Getty Foundation. Okay. So anyway, just to, to clarify that. And another thing that is coming out of um, the OSCE program is the OSCE toolkit, which is an open source set of tools that museums can use to, you know, build their own. Um, you know, it's one of many there, you know, in, in the academic community as well. There are a lot of different tools, open source tools uh, that are meant to enable publishing. Um, USC has a great one called Scalar. Um, that is designed to allow for the self-publication of text and images and media. So um, there are lots of explorable options and, you know, open, open source, open access is a, a great thing to tap into. Great. Hey, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I would also love to say that it, for small museums, it's really important to also talk to folks outside of the museum community. I mean, Amy, Amy is a great case in point, you know, with that kind of, if you went, if, if I was to go and know that I only had X amount of dollars and I don't have someone like Amy at my institution, but I might know someone like Amy in the community, um, and, and frankly, the reason that the Tumblr idea even came up is because my husband designs websites, and I can't afford his websites, but I told him what the problem was I needed to solve, and he's like, why don't you look at Tumblr and see if that's going to serve your needs? So there, you know, I'd really encourage, um, particularly the smaller museums, to look outside of our museum community um, and really tap into resources. Graphic designers are excellent at using a lot of free platforms too, and um, you know, you could go to Creative Mornings and meet any number of of graphic designers in your own city. Who would be able to help you think this problem through in a creative way and a, in a way that would match any budget? Great. So I think we have a, a question for Liz um, on the Walker project, and I'll read the question. I had a related one. Um, how much time was spent trying to develop a template or a format for the content? Were there times when new content was discovered or created that made working with the template limiting? And finally, I would add, um, is the, the, are the e-catalogs fixed? Or I saw one of the authors, it said author of a forthcoming essay, and if new research is discovered, is it able to be amended or, or um, updated? So maybe if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I'm not entirely sure about the first part of how long it took to develop kind of the the design and then the CMS. Um, I know that the Walker began talking about this project in 2009 and the first version of the project was not released until 2014. So that, that whole time wasn't spent in development, but uh, a large chunk was. And, you know, like a lot of other places of experience, the Walker during that time had a lot of, had a significant number number of staff members turnover, particularly in new media, so um, there were chunks of time where that was stalled. Um, let's see, what were the other parts of this question? Um, new content discovered made working with a template limiting. 
Yeah, so the template is based on this th the three columns that I mentioned in the beginning that allow for, you know, various kinds of content to be in either any of those columns, but it is set um, so that all of the iterations of the catalog would look similar. Um, you know, in the second volume, we reached the problem of these archive capsules that we wanted to create, which didn't fall within um, um, the, the model of the three columns. So that was, those portions were created. Very good, interesting. Um, well, yeah, all 10 minutes of tech, but the bad ones, right? Are we getting some bad feedback, or is it only me? Yeah, no, I'm it. That seems to be okay now. All right. Um, our next question is actually very interesting. Um, I w I'm going to read it. I wonder whether you still see e-publications as different from being websites. The MFA e-books still very much follow the book, book format, but with added functionality. And this is what I think of when I think of e-publications. But then the rest of you seem to create websites, even specifically talking of breaking up the linearity of book formats. Should we still talk about EPUBs, or are they just websites on specific topics? Cool. Very interesting. Who can jump in? Well, this was all this was all new to me. I mean, you know, I. Uh, it was really exciting to be able to do this ebook, but as I've said a couple times already, that if we were to, if we didn't have the existing print book already, we would have probably rethought this and probably would have made it some sort of a web-based thing. And it, it probably, well, I'm hopeful it still will be. The MFA has lots of, is in a big encyclopedic museum that wants to, you know, suit lots of different parts of our collection. Uh, but I think we're so media rich in in our department with the audio, with the video, and the combination of the two. Um, that I would ultimately like to see this morph into something that is on our website and, you know, becomes a, a portal for people to learn about music history and about instruments. Um, you know, g getting attention to the, the powers that be to do that is 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 different than you know me wanting to do it. So we'll see how we progress with that going forward. I think it's a question. It's a great question because it really gets to this question of of um, understanding the website as a medium in some ways, doesn't it? I mean, it's it's really looking at, at how we're using the internet in a way that maximizes what the internet has the potential to do. And right now, websites, I think it's a really valid observation that, that using Tumblr is a modified way of using a blog or a, or a website format. Um, I think it comes down to a question of who has the agency and the funds and the staffing to rethink the medium in some ways? Um, I, 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 the the question's making me think about Bjork's. Um, I think it's called Biophilia, the the app that she did, which is amazing, and it has all these ways that you go in and you go out and you can tap into places where you can engage it in different ways. And you know, it's just. Um, I think it's not been built into museums with people our age yet to think about the internet as a medium in the same way. And I think this is where it actually could be really useful to look to our interns and our students and really try to understand how they're using um, this technology and this medium in a different way to rethink um, to rethink it for the future because they have a fluidity that we just don't have. Even as, as versed as we are, you know, I, most of us here may not have grown up or, you know, we all remember a time before the internet. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a different thing when you've grown up with the internet and understanding how websites function um, to then be at the place where you can actually rethink it and, and um, yeah, I think I think this is a moment. It's an opportunity, and I, I do appreciate that that it does point to thinking through um, the medium itself. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on your goals too. So, for example, at my museum, we did a website that it, we call an online scholarly publication, and the the goal for us was to create something that. Um, 
dissertation committees would allow their, their students to cite. And so that, that imposed a, a set of requirements that we don't typically apply to our other websites. So for example, um, there's an editorial policy that that content doesn't change. Websites are typically underpinned by a content management system that allows you to change content in very dynamic ways. You know, sometimes we change our other websites many times a day. With a scholar, online scholarly publication, our definition is that we commit to this um, this text and we will not change it. If the scholarship around those objects changes in the future, as it will, we'll issue a new version. So that somebody can see a snapshot of what our scholarly perspective was on these objects in 2014, and they might also see what our, our perspective is on those same objects in 2018, but they could compare those two things side by side. And if a graduate student cited the 2014 publication, um, that citation would remain stable to the, the, the best of our ability. So I think it's a fantastic question and I think, you know, websites can be many, 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 many things and the web is evolving as we speak. Um, so I think figuring out what you mean by publication is almost the, the most important question at the outset. Thank you. Well, actually, May I uh, follow up on that? Um, no, uh, no, I lost my my screen. Back. I'm sorry. Um, you have another question? Sorry. Does anyone have any other questions or thoughts? If not, we can um, move to the conclusion. Oh, we certainly. How much? What time is it? Okay. Oh. Well. So, um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I really want to sincerely thank all the um, presenters. You did a fantastic job. It was so wonderful to learn about the various um, opportunities and your great work that, that you did. Um, thank you for the great questions for everyone in the audience. So, the last uh, question that we'll open up to everyone is uh, many of us are hopefully um, inspired to begin thinking about e-publications after this. Um, so what would you say, if you were to do it all over again, is the primary piece of advice you would give to a curator or an editor or a museum um, considering an e-catalog? The basic, you know, I wish I'd known at the time, or always ask yourself, don't forget, so the probably the the key piece of advice you would give somebody who may be a little intimidated uh, about moving forward. So Amy, why don't we start with you? Let's see, my key piece of advice. Um, gosh, I feel like <laughs> I feel like I've shared it already. But to recap, I would say um, no what your goals are at the outset and know what your budget is and work backwards backwards from there to figure out what your platform should be. Um, second, have a digital asset management strategy and someone who has that um, professional training and inclination. You can hire somebody on, on as a consultant to help you with that. Um, I don't think it's terribly expensive if you don't have someone in your institution um, but know where you're going to put the content in its highest resolution besides in the final um, form so that as technology evolves, you don't lose anything. Um, and I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. oh. I would say, it, it, regardless of what project you're doing, and I've had the, the blessing to do uh, curate two big shows at the MFA, um, and then this book was you know, another sort of curating project, Fortunately, it, we're, it, if we were able to, con to perceive all that we had to do on a project at the beginning, we'd be too terrified to do it. Thankfully, <laughs> our brains don't don't take it all in, and so once we're you know at the end of it, we go, oh my god, you know I can't believe I got through all that. So you know, one thing is to not underestimate how much time something is going to take to build in plenty of extra time to do this, so that when things go off the rails or your musician gets sick or something like that, or the instrument breaks. We don't. Well, we don't want that to happen. But uh, that, you, that you build in enough time, certainly for any project, whether it's an ebook or whatever. But uh, you know, I was really fortunate to to have a good team with our publication department to that they look at it from a different point of view and can kind of track what you're doing, 
so that I could I could really indulge in the creative process a lot more. So, uh, you know, to to take the advice of other people that are, you know, that that again bring a different viewpoint. Again, that's true of any project. This isn't restricted just to e-publications, but but to uh, to uh, embrace and and be glad for the the input from other people in uh, how to put this together. I would just recommend, I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said already, and, and I feel like I've touched on this also, but I would, I would just say, you know, don't be afraid to look outside of the museum world for inspiration and for ideas and for strategies to solve the problem. Um, there's a lot of people out there who are interested in um, the challenges that museums offer and the kind of content that, that we want to deliver. and I think that uh, it's really important to um, to step outside of our comfort zone sometimes to see if we can use use resources that we didn't expect to think through the problem in a new way. Um, so I guess I guess mine would be to for people embarking on the digital, um, which is a big you know a big field right now and a big there's a lot of meta conversation about you know digital publishing and what does it mean and all of this and I would and my biggest piece of advice I guess is don't get lost in that um, at the end of the day it's still about content it's still about communicating with your public and that you know whenever we're embarking on something new um, I think there's a, a draw to get kind of stuck in the, the flash and innovation but we need to be sure to balance that with, you know, clarity and rigor and generosity to our readers, just as we would in any other kind of presentation we're making. So, well, that that's all good advice that we should all take um, if we if we when when we are, and I assume we all will be in a situation where we'll be asked or want to. A tackle of um, an e-publication and e-catalog. Um, I think there are. Oops, I just see. I think there may be another question. Let me see that. Oh. Uh, sorry, uh, technology. Oh no, it's not a question. I'm sorry. It was a. Piece of advice, I guess, from someone else. I'm not quite sure where it came from. Start simple. Do something simple. It can still be really great, even if the content is limited to get off the ground. And I think that that really is a is a word to live by. Um, do we have another question amongst yourselves? We never really asked you to uh, you know to have questions of each other or comments or since we have a few more minutes left, we don't want to waste them. Mm -hmm. Nothing particular. I have a question, and, and in some ways maybe, Amy, um, this ties in with some of your experience, but um, I've never attended a Museums and the Web conference, and I know that those are annual, right? And I wonder if you have, and or if you haven't, if you know anyone who has, and if there's anything that you've heard from that sphere that could could help us think about this question about e-publishing too. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a um, there's an organization called MCN, which is a professional organization for museum technology, web, and digital media people. And there's a conference this November in New Orleans, and um, there are always sessions about e-publications, online publishing, um, scholarly content on websites. Um, also things like digital asset management, um, the connection between collections, databases, and online um, strategies. And then there is in the spring, there's a Museums in the Web conference, um, which is uh, very focused on web and digital media and similar topics. They're both great. We love when people from curatorial come. Um, you know, we all know each other, <laughs> so uh, the thing that I really like um, about MCN in particular is it's a very candid um, sharing of case studies and real-world advice about this is what worked and this is what didn't and this is what we learned. 
Um, my, my friend um, and former colleague Laura Mann is giving a presentation this fall. She did the evaluation for the Getty Foundation of the online scholarly catalogs. She has a fantastic amount of qualitative and quantitative data and she'll be talking about that at the conference. Um, it's really, uh, it's not a techie, uh, none of these gatherings are techie. All of us work in museums and small museums are very well represented and the dialogue between um, organizations is really exciting. There's really a spirit right now of open um, content and open source sharing of technical tools, whether that's the scholarly publishing toolkit that came out of the OSCE project or just kind of ad hoc like learning from Nanita about the way that she's used Tumblr. Um, and curators are um, are most welcome, <laughs> and, and so are educators and other um, people from museum publication departments who are who are typically represented. So yes, thank you for the opportunity to plug two forums where we would love to see any of you to dis continue the discussion that we've been having today. Wonderful. Um... One maybe very quick question before you go, Amy, maybe you'd be able to answer. How would one measure the success of an e-catalog? Are there metrics oh. or any <laughs> well, kind of... question. Um, one of the great things about online um, content in general is you get really great up-to-the-minute statistics about exactly what people are doing. If um, your web person can help structure it in a way that makes it um, gives you greater uh, access to the kind of information that you want. But we can see everything from how many users played a video to where they left off in that video. So, you know, maybe we're making five minute videos and people are only watching 75 seconds. That, that means we have to make those first 75 seconds count and probably shorten those videos. That's really valuable information. You can see where they're clicking. Um, but it helps to also know your goals because on, on you know, like on the big museum website that's selling tickets and promoting exhibitions, often you're just about traffic, right? You're really interested in getting as many people as possible to go there. With a, with a more targeted approach to, to content, for example, scholarly content online, depth of engagement can matter more than um, gross numbers. And so you want to know that and you want to ask for the right metrics. You don't want to be drowning in data that's not that useful to you. You know, you can find out what browsers people are using, what devices they're using, but more importantly you might want to know like how long is the average session, how many pages are they looking at, how many links are they clicking on, are they delving into that deep media content that costs you time and money to produce, what's the demand for these sort of conservation stories. Um, and that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to do them anymore if people aren't clicking on them. If you're structuring it in the right way you can figure out like did this one perform better than that one and what was it about that way of showing this content that was creating a better experience for someone um, who was consuming it. So I think I, I think there isn't a simple answer to success. I, you know, some, some organizations are trying to monetize these products. Um, others like my own have a policy that all content is free. So really there are as many measures of success as there are goals in putting this stuff out there in the first place. But um, a really good web person will be able to create for you a dashboard that speaks to your your goals and not, um, you know, not just overwhelm you with kind of a massive amount of user data that may or may not be important to you. So. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank Claudia, my my uh, partner in crime, for organizing this, and and of course Judith with AAMC, and uh, everybody who um, who participated, either submitting questions or just um, subscribed to the webinar. And um, as I said, on the AAMC uh, webpage, they have a more complete biography. As well as um, you can you can see these e publications in greater detail through that that information. So I would encourage everyone. These are really really um, incredible publications um, and uh, very very innovative. And I think it's something that um, we all should follow closely. So thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.